Sleep your way to the top with special guest Riley Jarvis on today's episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Pro Writing Aid. Every word I write needs to be perfect. One typo in an email and I get dozens of replies pointing it out and saying, thought you're an author. That's why I trust Pro Writing Aid. I have every plugin and feature they offer to check my blog posts and when I'm writing offline, no other tool even comes close. Score a lifetime license at servemaster.com forward slash Pro Writing Aid. Are you tired of dealing with your boss? Do you feel underpaid and underappreciated? If you want to make it online, fire your boss and start living your retirement dreams now, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Serve No Master Podcast, where you'll learn how to open new revenue streams and make money while you sleep. Presented live from a tropical island in the South Pacific by best-selling author, Jonathan Green. Now, here's your host. Now, this is a topic near and dear to my heart because a lot of entrepreneurs think of the way to the top is to sacrifice sleep. Like the less you sleep, the more you make. And I know when I started out, marathon sessions, working long nights, going to bed at dawn, waking up at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and doing it all over again. And I just couldn't do it for much longer. I just got sicker and sicker. So I'd love to know for you, how did you start becoming passionate about sleep? Where did your journey begin? Yeah, it's a really good question. So mine all started, it's us wounded warriors going through our own journey. Uh, who ultimately end up becoming health coaches sometimes. For me, it was no different. I started out about 10 years ago working in the finance industry, working just sometimes 12 to eight hour work days. Like it was pretty rigorous. And it was a dog eat dog world. And you had to be on your A game mentally and physically. But not too long, I was forced to quit my job just because I couldn't keep up anymore. And I went to the doctor and was diagnosed with Crohn's disease as an autoimmune condition for anyone that doesn't know. And it was at that point that the side effects from the medication they were giving me were actually making me feel worse. So kind of had my back against the wall and had to take health into my own hands. And so I would try diet one month. I would try exercise one month. But when I got to that sleep month, that's when everything started to change for me. And my blood markers started to improve suddenly. I started to have more energy. The brain fog went away. And all these things started to go up and up, as well as all these other things started to happen. But yeah, it was at that point it worked for me for sleep. So I started to help other people as well with their sleep, but through the lens of peak performance and other things. So seven years later, I am where I am today, just helping more entrepreneurs and different people around the world now. Yeah. It's always been interesting to me because we don't take sleep seriously until something goes wrong, you know, and there's people that have to take sleeping pills and there's people that have night terrors or sleepwalking. There's so many things that can happen in your sleep that really can make a huge difference. And I know for me, right, there was certainly a point in my career where I was tired all the time and I couldn't figure it out. And sometimes I've experienced where you sleep too much, like often there's like, that's associated with depression and like you're oversleeping. So what is the right approach? Let's start at the very beginning. What's the right approach to take when you're thinking about dealing with your sleep? Because there are so many apps that you put on the bed to measure like how well you're sleeping and it can, then all you do is think about the app. It's like when I'm getting my blood pressure taken, if I start thinking about it, my blood pressure goes higher. Like I don't want a high score. So Crazy, high right? Score. So you can self-sabotage, right? And how should someone start to approach sleep? And is it the same amount of time for everyone? Because some people are like, oh, I only need four hours of sleep a night. And I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, very good question. So the best answer is, to make it as easy and simple as possible. And the reason is because you're right, like we're just inundated at today's age with so much information, so much technology, so many things going on that we overcomplicate and we actually fall off the bandwagon. I mean, number one at the end of the day is consistency. If we can keep it simple to the point where we can be consistent with it, that is the most important thing. If we throw in all this complexity where we just get overwhelmed, and then we fall off with no do anymore and then just go back to old habits. That's what we don't want. So make it work for you. And your the second part is for sleep. How much do we actually need? Because we hear those people where we have a friend who only sleeps two, three hours a night and he just never gets tired, he drinks coffee, gets on with it. That's only about 1% of the population. Some people are genetically hardwired for that. But for the majority of us, we need about seven to nine hours of sleep every single night. Now, everybody is unique genetically, and it's not just a cookie cutter, okay, go to bed at this time, wake up at this time. There's something known as your chronotype. And it's there's also your sleep animal sign. And what that means is your genetics are more programmed for you to be a morning person or more programmed for you to be a nighttime person. And so if you can follow a schedule that's adapted to that, then you'll be in the best place. 30% of people are morning pre people, 70% are nighttime people. And so if you can have your work schedule or wherever that work, however it goes, work with that instead of against that, you work with your biology instead of against your biology, it'll reward you in ways you can't imagine. And that's really interesting to me. Now, can you change over time? Because I was like a massive night owl in my 20s, like partying all the time, staying up late all the time, working at night. And now which I never thought I would be. I get up at six in the morning, work out and 
do a lot during the day. So I wonder, is it possible to change or is it that I was always wrong about my sleep type? It's a really good question. So with your genetics, you are genetically hardwired. What your genetics are, you know, from the, if you did a genetic test when you're two months old or when you're nine years old, you would still get, the, get those same results. But there's a part of your genetics called epigenetics and it's how your genes express themselves. And it's, you can think of epi, I think in Greek or was Latin for on top of. So you can change it based on what your environment is. And so I think there's two parts to it. There is a part where you are genetically hardwired to be a certain type, but your environment can change things, but only so much. And so what I like to do with clients sometimes is to run a genetic test on them. We see are they a nighttime person or are they a morning person? And it's amazing. Like I'll see in real time, they always swear they're a nighttime person and they've been following that schedule. They go to bed late, but their genetic test shows their morning lark. And as a result of that, what happens is we change their schedule, just shift it back just a couple hours. And now all of a sudden we see that their schedule, their productivity just shoots to the roof. Their performance shoots to the roof, like 50% sometimes over a couple of weeks because we have that match now. And sometimes people swear by it just because they've been doing it for so long. But sometimes you don't know what you don't know just because you've been following the same habits for a long period of time. But at the end of the day, it's all self-experimentation. Yeah, that's very interesting because one of my favorite things about my life now is that I very rarely have to set an alarm clock. Like I can choose when I wake up. I can choose when I go to bed. I choose, I have total control of the start of my days. Whereas when you're a kid, you have to get up whenever school says, right? If you change schools, you have to get up at a different time and you go to bed when your parents say you do. And there is this rigidity, right? Same thing if you're working for someone else is that, well, you go to work when they say you have to go to work. And I used to do shift work, right? So sometimes you're working seven to 5 PM and then they shift you to another team. And now you're working from 2 PM to 11 PM. And it's such a jarring change that it takes a while for your body to get used to it. So you can do a blood test or a DNA test that tells you a genetic test. What else does that tell you these tests when you do the, that part of it? That's like, oh, I can tell just from look at your genes, what time you should go to bed. That's, I didn't even know that was a thing. That's very interesting. What else can you find out when you do that testing? What else does it tell you? Yeah, it's very interesting. So the genetics will kind of, yeah, it can take this so many ways, but genetics just gives you a window into what your biology actually needs. But then you have also different forms of testing that tell you like currently, what is your body state right now that it currently needs? Like where are the potential deficiencies? So other tests I like to run, for example, are like a hormone test. Hormones are extremely important for our sleep. It could be we, can't, we don't sleep because we have elevated cortisol levels while we sleep or before we go to sleep. We're having blood sugar spikes happening where our blood sugar will go up, insulin comes in to bring it back down. But when it goes too low, cortisol and adrenaline will come in to bring it back up. And as a result, it wakes us up in the middle of the night. You could have other things, for example, like your gut, you have leaky gut and these different hidden stressors inside of your body that are causing your body to be just overall inflamed. And so sleep is never fully restoring your body. It's just going from a debt state at the end of the night, just back to zero. You're never going into a surplus each and every day. And if you can think of your sleep like that, these lab tests will really show you where your body currently stands, where the hidden stressors are inside of your body, and then what you can actually do about it. And then you can take a sniper-like approach where you can give what your biology actually needs instead of just taking a cookie cutter approach and throwing everything against the wall and hoping something sticks. How does someone know something's wrong? Like, what are the signs? Like, because it seems like a lot of times for we wait until it's really bad, right? Like we say, oh, I'm only when I'm like really, really <laughs> depressed or only when my wife's just packing her clothes. Do I go time for a marriage therapist? So how does someone know? Like, what are some early warning signs? Like, how long should it take someone to fall asleep when they get into bed? Yeah, all really good things. And so there's two different ways you can look at it. So one is what you just said is where it's too late or maybe not too late and you reach a disease state. So whether it's diabetes, you have a heart related issue, and that could be somebody who's not sleeping properly for a period of time. Like quick example, Margaret Thatcher used to brag about back in the day that she only needed three or four hours of sleep. She eventually de developed Alzheimer's. That's because during REM sleep, we have these garbage truck cleaners that come through and clean up all the plaques inside of our brain. If we don't have that, these plaques can eventually contribute to some of those Alzheimer's. So, you know, it's, it's a chicken or an egg thing first, but so that's more of a disease state, but the like the kinds of testing I like to run is more functional based testing. This is where it's a lot more sensitive, sort of private healthcare. And we can see where there is just dysfunction in the systems inside of your body on a subtle level that could be causing brain fog, that could be causing you to wake up in the middle of the night and some of those things. But if you don't have those lab tests in place, you can just go by like getting to sleep. If you can fall asleep within five to 15 minutes, that's a pretty good sign. You usually don't want to wake up in the middle of the night or at least 
like once is sometimes okay, but if it's more than that, then there's probably something going on under the hood of your biology. And obviously you want to talk with your doctor, but the model that they operate from is you take a pill to cover the symptoms, which have their own side effects, but like, where's the end game with that? I just want, I want to ask that question without being biased. And then, so then at that point you, you want to get to the root cause because then it's a lot more sustainable. So it's, What's keeping somebody up at night? Is it their cortisol is off? Is it their bedroom environment's off where all this light's coming in while they're sleeping at nighttime? What do they do throughout the daytime? How resilient is your body? So there's a couple of different ways to look at that um, that are leading indicators. But you can even just journal and each healthy new habit you try in your life, just see how you feel. And then you can tie those together. Journaling, it's one thing that I never even wanted to do, but it's just amazing that meta level awareness that you can have and change your own circumstances. Once you see in paper, like, wow, I had no idea that existed. Cause we don't even know what we had for breakfast three days ago. Right. And so anything else beyond that can be difficult to keep track of if we don't write it down. I think that there's so many things that we don't realize can affect our sleep, whether it's noise or light, every single thing I own has like a light, like even like the charger for my wall that I plug other things into has a light. on. like, I don't need a light on this all the time. I often one of the things I do, I mean, it's a good idea, maybe you can tell me it's terrible, is I put a little piece of black tape over all those alert lights in my room because it just, it's like every piece of, and for some reason where I live, air conditioners always want you to know what temperature they're set to. So there's a bright neon glowing light. I'm always like, how do I turn that off? I don't you need know, a, the room <laughs> will tell me. And we don't realize there's all these little lights in the room. And then we, especially now people get on the phone, they're playing around on TikTok or watching videos. And I've heard this is where maybe a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, that there is an effect from that, right? Like from having light, like your bed, like the only thing you should do in bed is sleep. You shouldn't be in bed playing video games or it's all things I'm guilty of. I'm totally confessing here, playing video games on the Nintendo Switch <laughs> or you have your laptop on, you're watching videos. For me, one of the big moments in my career was when I could move my office out of the bedroom, right? For a while, everyone, you start, you have your computer in your bedroom, that's where it starts. And that can be, it creates a, like there's, it's like work and sleep are too close together. Like you can just roll out of bed and start grinding. And that can just, you wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. You go, oh, I don't just do a few minutes of work. So yeah. what about that stuff? What are some of the dumb things that people do that can really be damaging their sleep without even realizing it? Like some bad habits. For sure. Absolutely. So one of the, one of the easiest ones, and it's picking up more mainstream is blue light before we go to sleep. And that could be our iPhone. That could even just be like coming inside of our window. Like if we live downtown, the street lights could be coming through. So ideally you want to make it like an ideal environment would be at nighttime before you go to sleep, you put your hand in front of you and you wouldn't be able to see your hand because it would be that pitch black. So you want to think to yourself, how can I get as close to that as possible? So does that mean getting blackout curtains? Does that mean covering up any neon lights like you were talking about? Is that minimizing any, usually one, one to two hours before bedtime, we want to really reduce that blue light. So whether that's we wear blue light blocking glasses, whether that is we reduce, we don't see electro see electronics, we have a blue light filter on those. A really good strategy actually is just an hour before bedtime, pop in like an audio book or like some kind of video that you can listen to with all the lights off and you can put it on a timer too and just kind of let your mind drift away. And I've noticed by doing that and working with clients doing that, their sleep score improves and they just feel so much better during the daytime. But it's tough, right? Because for us to, some of us can't just fall asleep when it's very quiet and we just listen to our thoughts. We like to fall asleep with a TV on or something, but just know that the blue light will directly suppress your melatonin, which will directly suppress your REM sleep, which we need to feel fully restored the next day with our mind. And if we don't, what are we going to go towards? More coffee. More coffee is a stimulant. It stresses our body out more. So it's deeper and deeper down that rabbit hole. And then we don't have energy. So then we go to the doctor and then we eat poor foods because we didn't sleep well and we have more. of. So it's just this ongoing cycle that affects the sleep and the sleep affects all these other things. You've touched on a few things that are very important to me. I'm huge into blue light. So like all my monitors have at least two layers of blue light blocking. So they have, they're always low blue light monitors. I swear, they're always in low blue light mode and I have an additional software filter. And same thing for my phones. My main phone is actually an e-ink phone for that reason. So that's what I'm really thinking about. The dialing is some stuff that really matters because I've had a lot of vision problems. I had dramatic vision problems. I know there's some people that say that blue light's not a real thing, but like I was going blind and I ha I've had yeah. like incidents of blindness. When you go blind for six hours, like you start to take stuff real serious. And that's why I got really deep. And I noticed that like, especially now there's some really good ink monitors. I can't get them here. I'm trying so hard, but they're really hard to import to some countries. And it's like, you can switch to having an entirely black and white monitor with no blue light in it at all. Like that gets me very excited. Oh, wow. 
There's our LCD monitors now, which have no light in the LCDs with no lights. You have to use only sunlight. So I have a little one I use outside. And it's very interesting that these, if we don't know, because it, there is such an effect from these, from blue light that in other parts of your life too, it's very interesting. I'm wondering like, oh, you know, when I switched to all that stuff, my sleep did get better. So that's why I'm like, oh, that's very interesting to me because yeah, we, if we don't realize it, you have your phone in your room and there's this thing we do where we think everything is important. So we leave our phone like every time I used to have every single work email account, give me alerts at, to the point this 10 years ago, where I would start to have phantom buzzes. You know, you pull out your phone, you think there's one and there's not. So I leave my phones on full silent all the time because there's never that, there's never actually that level of emergency. I'm not a doctor, right? Like there's never an emergency so important that I need. I probably in the last, my entire career, my business, 12 years, probably had two emergencies worth me getting up in the middle of the night and fixing them. But we think every text from someone. And so I think that's the work personal balance is so important. Like I have two phones. One has my work email, one has my personal email. For that reason, to kind of separate them and have a separate phone for when I'm shooting videos for TikTok and stuff, because that's work. But we have a tendency to mix work and play more and more. Like a lot of people, they work from their laptop and it has their games on it and things like that. And that I worry about that too, that as we start to mingle work and not work, as we start to do more and more things, we're just blasting more lights into our eyes that all of this just starts to have a cumulative effect. But you also mentioned that like it can really affect your health and these other things can happen. What are some health signs? Because you did mention getting up in the middle of the night. I wake, once I hit 40, I started getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. So that like that's mm-hmm. a change that happened. It's like, oh, have, when I'm a little kid and then when I'm over 40, that's like a new thing. But what are the signs like or that someone should look for like in the rest of their day? Like you talk about brain fog, but can you define that? Like what does it mean? Or how would someone know they have a brain fog? Yeah, that's definitely a good one. It's a bit of a loaded term, Mike. Right? Because it's like, well, what is brain fog? And what does not having brain fog feel like? And some people have been walking through days and they don't even know it. So brain fog is, it's different for everybody, but it's like the inability to focus. It could be like a thing of focus. It could be concentration. It could be memory related. Like if you just feel yourself, like just think when you dr- when you drink alcohol and the next day you feel hungover and you your brain just doesn't feel as fast as it did before. Or let's say you're used to drinking coffee in the morning, but you don't drink coffee and your brain just isn't firing as fast. But just think of it in that point of view of your brain is just not as clear as it could be. I just speak general there just because it could be taken so many different ways, but why people can have brain fog could just be blood sugar related issues. It could be their brain is like actually inflamed from the foods that they're eating, like high fructose corn syrup, sugar, and all these different things that are, that are causing it. Or like if you eat a very heavy meal, you know how you feel tired afterwards and you just can't think properly and you just want to go to sleep. Think of that as like a subtle form of brain fog and that's just a change, but it's all relevant, right? It's just, well, what was somebody's baseline and what was their new thing of dealing with that? But when you do get better sleep and when you don't get sleep, you probably notice this shift in your mind as well. You maybe have better emotional control. You can think more clearly. You have those soft skills. So for some entrepreneurs, when they're on a sales call, they can increase their sales calls ratio when their sleep score gets higher because they have those soft skills. It's not what you say. It's, it's the intonality. It's everything between it, but your ability to focus for long hours. Like some people, instead of doing an eight hour day, they can finish that. Like imagine finishing your day by noon because your focus is just so on point. You have that deep work and that flow that you're in and you're not just checking your phone every two seconds because your brain now has that ability to just focus cleanly on the thing that you're focusing on the thing at hand and at task. So presence is another one too, I would say, but everything else, excuse me, you touched on a couple different apps people can use to start reducing some of this brain fog is getting your sleep down on point. So an application I love on the computer screen, it's amazing you talked about those monitors, is an application software called Iris. Uh, it's called irisTech.co. And it's a really good one that people can use to not only minimize the blue light, but also reduce the screen flicker rate and all these different things. I think it's only a couple bucks a month. There's one called Flux, which is good, but this one takes it a step further. Then blue light blocking glasses. My favorite brand is called Twilight. I think they're these ones are called the Twilight Classics. Let's see if I can pick up them here, actually. They look like this. So it makes you look like X-Men a little bit. They're probably about a hundred bucks for the glasses, but they got peripheral vision and everything like that. But it really can help you with sleep. And what you'll find when you wear them is a couple hours prior to when you would normally go to bed. So let's say you typically fall asleep at 10 p.m. If you pop these on at 8 p.m., you'll find like 8.30, 9 o'clock, 
you're ready to fall asleep. And what that is, is your body's natural inclination to fall asleep. It's just because we're exposed to that blue light that we have the second wind effect and it makes us stay awake longer than we actually should. So everything you said about blue light, yeah, like it can lead to serious things. Like they've shown like it can increase your cancer risk over time and just specific disease risk and everything else that goes along with it. Yeah, it's very interesting how technology can be so far ahead of our bodies because it's so long it takes so long to figure it out like we were going to bed to candlelight 150 years ago right it's so fast technology is changing my kids don't even know what a pager is and i was excited to have one in high school <laughs> there's all these technologies that are jumping and now my kids know how to use a cell phone they can't believe that some of the screens in our house aren't touch screens they're always trying to touch my computer <laughs> I'm like no these aren't not everything's a touch screen and it happens very quickly and i do worry about those things like I know that some technology just makes your attention span shorter and shorter and that we don't have we don't have enough time to even know what like the old type like CRT computer monitors were doing before we're into flat screens and now we're into a new technology and that it does like you do have to be very proactive. And only when I became serious about what was happening was I able to really make a difference. Like I haven't had a blindness since in a few years, whereas before I was having one a week or one a month for a long time before I got just really got really crazy about every piece of technology and always limiting eyes and always trying to be near outside so I can look outside a lot. And there, you have to be really proactive because yeah, you can wait too long. I do wonder as well. I know so many people that like, they can't start their day unless they have a coffee. And I was interested, you brought that up to me because that's other members of my family. I've never been a coffee person. It always makes me sick to my stomach. So it's, what about those people that are drinking and sometimes it's so many, like, oh, I drink six cups of coffee a day or eight cups of coffee, or they turn the machine on multiple times. I have limited, you can tell I don't really drink coffee because I don't know how to describe it very <laughs> well. Like I have limited knowledge, but I, you know, or they're going to Starbucks several times a day. I wonder about that. Can you tell me how that affects you? And like, should we need, should you need coffee to start your day? Like I've always thought there's something wrong with that. Like you should be able to wake up and not be tired. Yeah. Absolutely. So what you just said is bang on. And it's one thing I think of just like the recent hustle culture too. You know, we're just trying to get more done, sleep less, sleep is seen as this liability in order to get ahead. And coffee is something that we can use to help us achieve that goal of success or whatever that looks like. And so what I say is if whatever we're using, whether it's coffee or anything else, if it's used as a crutch of a deeper problem going on, then that's a net loss for us at the end of the day. So if our bodies are completely taxed, we're not sleeping well. Like if we were to zoom in and imagine our body was like all these little workers that were trying to make our body run. If they were really like screaming in overdrive that like we need a break right now, but instead we just keep adding fuel to the fire, more coffee, more coffee, then it's not going to be good for us. And then as a result, we'll feel more tired because we're more stimulated at nighttime from all the caffeine we had the day prior. And now it's just that same thing happening again and again. And a big reason for why that can happen for people, not everybody, but that I especially see in the lab testing is their hormones, especially cortisol. Your adrenal glands produce cortisol. Cortisol is good. We want cortisol highest in the morning and lowest before we go to sleep. But when we've been pushing go for too long and pushing on the gas for too long, it's almost like it's a bad analogy, but like whipping a tired horse. You can think of the whip as the coffee and think of the horse as your body running. You can only do it so much before you have to increase the dose, increase the dose, increase the dose. Now your body just with that same amount of caffeine, it builds adaptation to it. And then it just can't go anymore. To the point where like even having four cups of coffee, five cups of coffee, it doesn't have that same effect as it did maybe six months ago, one year ago. And then you just keep doing that. And that's the point where people go from coffee to maybe like more high, higher advanced forms of stimulants, you know, medication and things like that down the road versus if you could get to the root cause of what is causing your hormones like this in the first place, cut coffee out or at least minimize it as much as you can give your body a break to build up those systems. Now you can reach a point where you don't need coffee. You have more energy. You're not running on a dirty, not a dirty high, but like a dirty for, source and form of energy. You have it that just lasts all day long. You don't have a sudden energy spike and then a crash shortly after. It's just this clean source that's sustainable all day long where your body's buzzing. And it's entirely possible to achieve if you give your body the right inputs, it will give you the right outputs to allow you to do that. What's the amount that's a sign something's wrong? Is one cup of copy a day okay? Is two okay? Is three too many? Is there a sign when someone's trying to self-assess? They go, oh, maybe I have a problem because I need this many. Or is it overall how they respond to the coffee, right? If they see, like, I think if someone says, I can't start my day without coffee or don't talk to me until I've had my coffee, like they have those cute mugs. Yeah. To me, that's such a red flag. Like I've always been worried about chemical dependent ability to work. Like I had these friends in college who 
would have to take Adderall or something. They couldn't study or they couldn't study for a test. And so they're, unless they take that. And that always made me very nervous. Anytime your ability to do critical stuff replies on relies on something external. That's always made me nervous. But is there a sign before then, like an earlier thing, someone would go, oh, maybe I do have a problem. Like even in the gray phase where they should at least be thinking about it. What are, What's that amount of yeah. coffee? Yeah, it's a really good question. And the answer is it's all relative and it's all case by case. And the reason is this is because genetically, some of us are a fast metabolizer of coffee. Some of us are a slow metabolizer of coffee. So what that means is some of us who drink coffee, it'll pass through a system fast. Like some people can drink coffee at 7 p.m. and go to sleep fine at 10 p.m. And that doesn't affect them. But other people can drink coffee at 10 a.m. And they're still wired at 10 p.m. because it's slower for that to pass through their system. Caffeine has a half-life of seven hours. And so the, just as a side point, if you were to drink coffee, let's say 3 or 4 p.m. And you were going to go to sleep at 10 p.m., you would still have, let's say, about a quarter of that coffee going through your veins before you go to sleep. And that would be equivalent to just put that in perspective. You go at 9.30 p.m., you go to Starbucks, you order a quarter shot of espresso, chug it back go right to bed and hope to fall asleep. It would be that same equivalent. So that's why it's very difficult for some people. And that's why it's case by case. But what are the warning signs? Like how much should you have? Ideally having one cup of coffee, like coffee does have many benefits or right? there's antioxidant benefits. There's a lot of these things. And so at that point you have to weigh the pros and the cons, right? And usually I would say typically one cup of coffee before 2 p.m. In the daytime is good for most people. But again, if you don't know what your genetics are, try and sense like, where do you fall in that line? Like, me, for example, I just need one cup of coffee and I don't do it all the time, but maybe I'll have one or two cups of coffee a week. I'll have it in the morning and it can help me get my day started. And that could be a day that I'm fasting because that can help subside hunger. So it just really depends. Or if I'm like working out, that could be very good as a stimulant for that as well. But if that's better, I don't rely on it. I like the taste of coffee. I like the smell of it in the morning, but I don't rely on it. It's not a crutch. And so if you rely on something as a crush, you have to ask yourself, where is that exactly coming from? Because if everything was working fine in your biology as it should, then you wouldn't necessarily manifest some of these symptoms of fatigue and tiredness you're experiencing. Maybe your body needs like a, you know, like a full week weekend reset um, to really just go back to, to become centered again, to become grounded again. And then at that point, you can reintroduce coffee back in. But obviously there's caffeine withdrawal as well. So there's things you can do to mitigate that, but that's another conversation. I'm trying to think if I even know anyone who only drinks one cup of coffee a day. Like I feel like every single person I know, it's more than one, right? It's more, it's yeah. always at least two or three. And so that's interesting. How do you feel about nootropics? There's like this whole industry around focus now, and there's a wide spectrum of things that obviously don't do anything to things that do a lot, right? Everyone saw that movie Limitless and is chasing that pill. Like, oh, did you? Yeah, yeah, the NCT. And I understand that desire, right? And I know... I have a lot of people that I talk to that are all on the spectrum at different places. And focus has just become a huge industry now, kind of like organization has, right? Like everyone wants to do getting things done and how to be more efficient. So much content and so many programs to help you be more efficient and more focused. And it feels like it's the new thing. Like before it was multitasking, before they found out multitasking is terrible. Like every test showed it so bad, <laughs> right? You just get bad at everything. But what about this chasing of focus? Is it focusing? Is it like looking at the symptom? rather than disease? Good question. Uh, focus is a very interesting one. I like to see focus through the lens of better optimization. And if we don't have focus, it doesn't mean we're necessarily in a disease state. I like to look at first principles though. It's where does that focus come from? For our body and our, for our brain to focus, we need dopamine. The precursors to dopamine are, there's L-dopa and you have tyrosine. And when you break it down, these all come from foods that we eat that pr provide that breakdown. But once our body takes in those foods, it has to simulate those nutrients for our brain. And so if our gut's not working properly for that assimilation to happen for our brain to use, then that's where we're not getting as much focus as we could. And so that's why just thinking about it as just a brain problem isn't necessarily the best way to do it. And it doesn't mean your brain is in a disease state or anything. It just means it could be whether it's neurotransmitters, whether it's blood sugar, whether it's inflammation, these could all be things that are contributing to your body not being able to focus as it should be. But nootropics are very interesting because it can be used two different ways. Whether you are somebody who's a biohacker who focuses on health, who already follows a healthy diet, who follows good sleep and all these different things, maybe you're already at an eight and you're looking to use nootropics to really just get those last five, 10, 15, 20%, or you somebody who's not doing any of these things, much like coffee, and are you just using that as a bandaid and a crush in order to in order in order to get there? And so I would say, like, 
taking nootropics to subsidize, to supplement a poor lifestyle, a poor diet, poor other things, it might work temporarily, but compared to if you were to improve your diet, exercise and do all these other things, and then you add the nootropics, you will just see like an 100 X in the results of all those things put together. And it will just work tenfold, but you're right. Like nootropics, it's a very interesting industry and it's very exciting. And they, you know, like Adderall and Vyvanse and what people talk about, you know, like new vigil and some of these other ones, paracetam and aracetam and all these ones have become very popular these days. And I think those are good to take. I mean, everyone is case by case, but just from what I have seen, they don't seem to have any side effects. And I've experimented with some of them and I had great results, but I wasn't using it every single day. It Again, it was just kind of used intermittently. And just keep in mind, how should I say this? Trying it once, trying it twice and giving your body a break to come back to baseline is I think a just general good philosophy and a good approach to take. Don't try and take it every day. Give your body a break to go to baseline with ever, with, with whatever new thing you try. And that's a good way to experiment with some of these things. Not try everything at once. Be a scientist. Try this. Write down. How did you feel? Okay. Now try the next thing. Write down. How did you feel? If you throw in everything at once, you won't be able to isolate those variables. Yeah. Cause there's in our industry, everyone's there's so much of that because there's some things that my friends take and I try it and I have no effect. And there's other things I'll try it like one. And I'm like, this is a ride for like eight hours. I'm like, this yeah. is really, and it's, and it, that's the thing is like, it's the dosage is so important. And I usually am like, I got to do start off at a quarter or half when anyone else is taking of even like any of those like focus drugs. I try, I'll try to drop it. I'm like, I can't do a full one. Cause I've, I don't want to be focused for eight hours. Totally. Yeah. I also wonder about our generation. I'm at the exact age of when or I'm one year over where they started diagnosing everyone with ADD. And then now that seems to not exist anymore. Now they've switched and everyone has ADHD. And I just wonder, because almost, I think they've diagnosed almost half of boys with it. And I just feel like, is that really what's happening? Because I went to my doctor when I was 30 and I was like, do I have ADD? And he's like, well, what are your ideas about? And I told him a bunch of them. He goes, well, aren't all the, don't all those help your business? And they are all parts of my business. Like I have lots of nonlinear thoughts about growing my business and projects. And most of my ideas work out. He's like, yeah, if you have ADD, you have the good kind. I was like, oh, I had a cool doctor, but it's also, I wonder, right? If I'd been one year younger, right? I would have been one of those kids because a lot of my friends or who were younger, they got all diagnosed with stuff and the answer to everything was a pill. I just wonder, maybe that's where I'm the exact age though, where like, you started getting a television in your bedroom. You started getting, and that's a game changer, right? As soon, once you get the television in your bedroom, then it can be on all the time as a kid and it can just no sound. So you're just getting light and your parents don't know. I wonder if as you're thinking about this, talking about this, it makes me start thinking maybe there's some changes that happened in our culture that maybe not everyone has, right? This disease, because it's so, it seems far too prevalent, right? And to be like, oh, the answer is like to make you calm down. But there's other things going on that we kind of, Again, we always seem to go after the symptom, not the disease, right? It's like, exactly. I, I know for me, if I don't exercise for three days in a row, I start to get depressed mm, and so yeah. I don't have a choice, right? I'm like, oh, I don't want to be depressed. So there's things I have to do as someone who like, when I was younger, the answer to depression was pills, right? Pill, 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 and lots of therapy sessions. And it's like, well, no, there's, it is other parts of your body are interrelated, but we have started to just disconnect everything, right? We just look at what's the shortest solution and the solution, everything does seem to be prescription. And once you're on one, it's so hard to get off. So uh, for people out there, not a lot of people can afford to start doing genetic testing. And they're like in an early phase, they're like, I don't even know if I have a problem. What's like the first thing you tell people to do, right? You, you mentioned journaling. Is there like, and I know there's this thing, like you can have an Apple watch or any of those technology watches on your wrist that tracks your sleep, but also then you're trying to sleep with a watch on. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, it's so... Because I've tried it a few times and I've tried those things where you put your phone on the bed and it measures your rustling, but it doesn't work if you're married because if my wife moves, now it says, right, it's measuring the wrong rustling. Do you rate any of those things, like those technology solutions that are watching you or is that the wrong place to start? Really good question. And it's just, again, it's just inundated. People were just inundated with all this information. Same thing with the laptops. It's like, well, do I start this first or do I try these other things? It's like, what do I do? I don't have the money to start these. And it just goes on and on sometimes. So what I would typically say is this, do the lowest hanging fruit things first that are easiest to implement that are inside your control and that you can start doing today. And that are also inexpensive. First on the trackers though. So I'm wearing one right now called an Aura Ring. And I'll show you in the camera what it looks like. 
but it has technology inside of it that will track your sleep. They're specific to sleep. Out of all the sleep trackers, it is my favorite and it doesn't have a screen on it. So I find it's the most accurate, yada, yada, yada. The other ones are really good too. And I think having a tracker as opposed to not having a tracker is probably better because if you combine that with the journaling and you can see the objective data, you think, oh, that wasn't my head. I actually did have a bad sleep. Oh, it looks like my REM sleep was kind of low tonight. Oh, it looks like my heart rate variability was lower than it should be. So I probably don't want to push it too hard in the gym today because my body needs more time to recover. The more tools we have for this, the better that we can, the better that we can be. So that's like monitoring to see how our body is actually feeling. Part two of that would be like implementing the actual habits in order to sleep better. That is very easy for us. So the easiest things would just be like our bedroom environment, like lowering the temperature, making it very dark, trying to relax like 30 minutes before bedtime. Like, can we Think of it like active recovery or passive recovery. Are we just passively watching Netflix, drinking a beer, hoping to wind down because we're stressed out from work? Or are we doing meditation? Are we doing like a hot cold shower? Are we doing an salt bath, like a float tank? Do we do like a yoga session? Do we take a walk outside? In terms of like minutes, we were able to downshift from fifth gear down to first gear, ready for bedtime, much faster with that active recovery. And those are just like so easy to do. And other things, for example, are just like, like you can supplement certain things like magnesium is good, you know, like Epsom salt bass or form magnesium. So that is very good as well. And like not eating very heavy meals before bedtime, that can be one, not like exercising too rigorous, rigor, rigorously before bedtime. That is one thing we can try. There's tools to help with this. Like if we want a cool bed, we can have the chili pad that blasts cold air into our sheets, or there's just these different things that we can try, but we always want to do the basics first. And we want to implement one variable at a time and see whether we make a mental note or we actually journal it, take note of how does it actually make us feel. And I guess what the word is here is just better internal awareness. And with that awareness, we can start making more implementations on the fly. And as a result, just start to feel better. Other ones from our, for our bed, I won't go into why, but we can elevate where our bed is on about three inches. So our bed is actually on an incline. What this will actually help do is our lymphatic system with the drainage while we sleep. It'll help create that positioning for the drainage and give our body a bit of a break. So that's just been shown to have one, you know, to help with sleep. Sometimes wearing socks before we go to sleep, but we want to focus more principles here instead of just one-off things to do. We can always do these tips, but then at the end of the day, it's not using a crush in order to subsidize this. It's actually getting to the root cause of what's going on. So I like to go simple and think of it as the pyramid. And as we start to go down, we start to optimize. Then eventually you can do some lab testing, go deeper with some of this stuff. And then at that point, it's not just sleep, like it's energy, it's focus, it's all these other things, but you can't be hard on yourself. You are where you are and you'll get there when you'll get there, as long as you keep following the journey. I think that's really good for me. I mean, even though I'm not perfect at sleep, it's always a journey for everything is that definitely decreasing light in the bedroom made such a difference, especially because some of the lights are blinking, which is the absolute worst thing you can have. Yeah. And covering yeah. like putting a little piece of tape over all the, cause you don't need to know, like now your toaster wants you to know if it's on. It's like insane. I don't need all these <laughs> like lights to know everything's on everything with all of that stuff. I get it why they exist. It's like a cheap solution to saying if it's working or not. But yeah, I recommend, that's the first thing I would say is really look at how much light's in your room. The blackout curtain's such a good idea. I remember when a friend told me about that. He's like, yeah, I sleep in pitch black. That got me very interested in that because also like we have the Wi-Fi router in your room. It's like a huge mistake because that's the light blinks on that intermittently or things that make a noise. So we have like I have a water machine, you know, the thing you put five gallon water on top because you can't drink tap water here, you'll die. But that thing makes a noise because it's got a refrigerator part intermittently. It may, that's why, because otherwise I'd have one in the office. Like I don't want it to go off right now while we're recording. Sometimes you're tempted to put that in the bedroom so you have water right near the bed, but then that happens. So some of these things we don't realize that are making noises in the night. So I think what you're saying is really good. There are some simple things we ignore, like how loud everything is, like cities are so loud and we just get used to hearing car noises or motorcycle noises outside that actually like, you can make your room quieter. You can make your room darker. And that's like, I like things that you do once and it has a long-term effect. I really love that, right? Like you totally. Do, you change the room yeah. once, you make things better. And then it's very interesting. I'm probably going to talk to my wife about raising one end of the bed tonight. Just worried she'll fall out of it. <laughs> like roll right out of it. <laughs> this has been really interesting to me. So really, really useful. Where can people continue the conversation with you, find out more about what you do, kind of do some sleep self-assessments and figure out where they are on the spectrum and if they need help or how much help they need or if they're in a dramatic situation, where can they find you? 
Yeah, definitely. They can just go to my website. It is vtagsleepconsultant.com. On side of there, there's a lot of resources. They can join the weekly email list. There's a bunch of free, there's my ebook on there. They can even schedule a 10 minute free one-on-one directly with me. And I can create them just a custom tailor plan for them to help sleep better as well. So everything's really on there. And if they want to get in touch with me directly, it is Riley, R-I-L-E-Y at thesleepconsultant.com. And I heard you're working on a new program, The Sleep Solution. I want to hear about that a little bit. Yeah. So the sleep solution system is one that I reached. It's a program that I, be, I recently finished. It's truly revolutionary. It's about, uh, it's about 20 hours long. The thing is a beast, but bringing you basically to a state that I call sleep nirvana. And what that is the ability to get to sleep within 15 minutes, stay asleep uninterrupted. You, you know, we're not waking up at all for seven to nine hours and then waking up with, a, with an abundance of energy that lasts all day long without the need to take any stimulants at all. And so that's the end goal. So inside of the program, it's all the exact step-by-step -step things that you have to do in a very easy way that fits to your life in order to achieve that goal. And it's all, we're looking at every single part of your biology in a systematic way to get you there as fast as possible. So again, it is sustainable. So you go through the program for eight weeks, you go through just this acute phase, you give your body the resources to finally build back up again. And after that, yeah, you're really cruising for many, many years to come. It sounds great. Thank you so much for spending time with us today, Riley. I really appreciate it. I know I learned a lot. Thanks so much, Jonathan. It was an honor being on today. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Starting your blog is an amazing step. Now it's time to get your first 100 raving fans as quickly as possible. Let me show you the shortcut to this milestone with my free guide at servemaster.com forward slash 100. That's forward slash 100. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Serve No Master podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss another episode. We'll be back next week with more tips and tactics on how to escape the rat race. Please take a moment to leave a review at servenomaster.com forward slash iTunes. It helps the show grow and more listeners means more content for you. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.